Isaiah 61, I'm going to speak this morning about deep roots, having deep roots. I want you to stand with me. I'm just going to read the first three verses, follow along. The Spirit of the Lord is, uh, the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, or the year of Jubilee, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Thank you, Father, for your word. We ask you to be glorified, Father. Be glorified here this morning. Be glorified in everything that is said and done. In our lives, be glorified, Father. God, in our speech, in our conduct, in our thoughts, in our homes, Lord, in our schools, in our churches, be glorified, Jesus. Have your way. Have your way, Father, as we yield to you and we say, let it be done on earth as in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. You can sit down. Amen. Now this passage of scripture, Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, was quoted in part by Jesus when he debuted his public ministry. You recall in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 19, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recover his sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of Jubilee, the time when slaves were released and debts were canceled. So when Jesus was on the earth, Acts 10.38 says, He went around doing good and healing all that were oppressed. Oppressed by whom? Oppressed by the devil. How did he do it? For God was with him. Went around doing good, healing all that were oppressed by the devil. The oppression of the devil is not just something that happens spiritually. It's physical oppression. It's spiritual oppression. It's, it's emotional. It's oppression. It literally means to bring pressure to bear on your life. Pressure that is ungodly. Pressure that God never intended for you to experience in your life. He went around doing good. Releasing prisoners, preaching the good tidings of the gospel to the poor, healing the brokenhearted, giving us beauty for our ashes, the oil of joy for our mourning. Now, why did he do this? Look with me again at Isaiah 61. For what purpose? That we might be called something. What? Trees of what? Righteousness, the planting of the Lord. For what purpose? That he might be glorified, that God would be glorified. You were bought at a price. I was bought at a price. We're to glorify God with our body, with our spirit, with our soul. The purpose of God saving us was that we would become trees of righteousness, using that metaphor, that he might be glorified. Now, the word tree here literally means a strong tree, like an oak tree. God has called us to be oak trees. And, you know, an oak tree can withstand the inclement weather. The oak tree can, can withstand the tempest. But we're not to be tumbleweeds. We're to be oak trees. Amen? And we know that an oak tree has deep roots. God wants us to be established and rooted in Him. Now, God demands fruit from our lives. Did you know that? You cannot be fruitless and say you're a Christian. If you're not bearing fruit, something's wrong. Something's wrong with the tree if you're not bearing fruit. There are some people, without getting into deep theology this morning, I, I don't want to go there, but let me just say that there are some people that from the time they've quote-unquote been born again to the present, they haven't really borne any fruit. According to the Bible, you were never born again. A good tree, what? Produces what? Good fruit. It's impossible for a good tree, a healthy tree, to not produce fruit. We will produce fruit if we are the planting of the Lord. 
Go with me just for a moment into 2 Kings chapter 19. I want to show you a powerful verse we're going to kind of use as a foundation this morning. 2 Kings 19, verse number 30. 2 Kings 19, verse number 30. Now, this is a word given by the prophet. He speaks of a remnant. A remnant are a people that have been called out of a people. And this is a remnant that has escaped to the house of Judah. In other words, the survivors. And these survivors, he said, who have escaped to the house of Judah shall again take root downward. Now notice that. But as they take root downward, what happens upward? They bear fruit upward. Do you see that? They take root downward, and as a result, they bear fruit upward. Oh, hallelujah. God has called us to bear fruit. Jesus said, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. The New American Standard says, so you prove that you're my disciples. The proof of fruit, uh, the proof of your discipleship, of the authenticity of your salvation and your discipleship is that you bear fruit. 15 verse 16, you did not choose me, our Lord said, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. What kind of fruit? Fruit that should remain. Fruit that will last. Much fruit, ample fruit, but also enduring fruit. Jesus expects us and demands from us that we would bear fruit. Now, in the natural, if the root system is healthy, if it's securely planted, the tree will grow and flourish. Romans 11, verse number 16, Paul said, And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Did you hear that? If the root is holy, so are the branches. So, our branches are to bear fruit. But branches on their own, not capable of bearing fruit. Branches have to abide into a root system. Jesus said in John 15, verse number 4, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you what? Will bear much fruit. Will. What is a vine? Vine is simply a root. And when you abide in the vine, in the natural, when a branch abides in the vine, what happens? The life that is in the roots flows from the vine into the branches and it bears fruit. Now, Jesus said we are to abide. What does it mean to abide? Well, it's the Greek word meno, M-E-N-O. And if you go with me just over to John chapter 14 for a moment, I'm going to show you what it means. John chapter 14. We've been in John 15. We're going to just look at one verse here. Verse 23. Jesus answered, said to them, If anyone loves me, he will what? Keep my words, obey my commandments, depending on what translation you have. Now, if you love God, you will do what? Obey him. All right. Now, here's what he says. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him, and we will what? Make our home with him. King James says, make our abode with him. It's the same word for abide. An abode is a home. It's a place of residence. Oh, hallelujah. Here's what Jesus is saying. That if we are going to bear much fruit, we must learn to make our residence in God. We must learn to move from visitors to permanent residence. You see, a visitor to a country has limited rights and privileges. But a permanent resident or a citizen has full access to all the benefits and privileges that that nation offers. You see, God doesn't want visiting rights with his children. He wants full custody. 
He's not looking for visitation. It's not about visitation. It's about habitation. You see, the anointing isn't something that comes upon us. If you understand the anointing, 1 John 2.29 says, the anointing that you've received abides in you. Same word. It's permanently resident in you. Oh, hallelujah. The anointing is permanently resident. That doesn't mean that the anointing just comes upon me then when I preach. The anointing comes upon me in the home. <laughs> the, the anointing comes upon me when the TV guy, you know, when the, when the internet service guy shows up, like the other day of at Rock and Ivy's. And, and God gave me four specific words of knowledge for him and I, and I shared the words of knowledge with him and, and he just started shaking his head saying, this is, this, I can't believe it, this is God, this is, this is blowing me away, this is blowing me away. And I even saw a tear in his eye. And when it was all said and done, we find out that he's a former NFL player who's a backslidden. You see, why did the, the anointing kicked in in the home? The anointing is for the marketplace. The anointing is for the street. The anointing, the purpose of it is that you can release it in your home anywhere. It's an anointing that abides. But in order for the anointing to abide in us, we need to learn to abide in Him and in His Word. It's a place of being fixed permanently to God. It's uninterrupted communion. How do we... Walk in the power and the anointing of God. How do we experience? What is the fruit? The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Okay, the fruit of righteousness. James 3.18. The fruit of our lips giving thanks. All these things. Talk about the fruit. All these different references. But what is fruit? In the, what is fruit? A simple definition. Fruit is a manifestation of the life that is in the tree. Fruit is a manifestation of the life that is inherent in the tree. The fruit of God is simply a manifestation of the life of God that is in us. If you are abiding in God and His life is flowing in you just like the sap flows from that vine into the branch and it just continually pours in, then what happens is you will organically, naturally, you will just bear fruit. <laughs> I mean, where we live, we have a lot of orange trees around us. And you know, we just finished orange season. We have a grapefruit tree in our yard. And I want to tell you that I have never yet seen an orange tree or a grapefruit tree go, bear fruit. Bear fruit. I can do it. Bear. Yeah. I've never seen it. What do they do? They just hang out. Hang out. Really, that's what God's saying. Hang out with me. Stay connected to me. Abide in me. Don't just become a visitor. Man. Samson, the anointing departed from him. And I know this Old Testament is a little different. But the truth is, the anointing departed from him. He knew it not. Why? Because the only time Samson called on God, the only time Samson needed the anointing was when he was in trouble. How many of us are like that? When we're in trouble, oh God, help me. Get me out of this mess. Thank you, God. See you whenever. Next time I need bailed out, I'll call upon you again. Deliver me. Answer me. No, no. The anointing abides. Listen. You bear much fruit as you abide in Him. Now, here's what I want you to understand. The Scripture says that there are at least two things that we need to do in order to bear fruit. Both of them having to do with the root system. Number one, we must make sure there is no toxic roots present in our lives. Hebrews 12, 15 says that we are to not have a bitter root that would spring up causing trouble and by this many become defiled. What does a bitter root mean? Now in English or in our culture often we think well bitterness is I'm angry, I hate you, you know, I'm unforgiving. But that's not what bitterness means in either the Old Testament or the New Testament. It literally means toxic or poisonous. Wormwood. So he's saying that anything that is in you that defiles you. Now what does he mean anything that is in you that defiles you? 
Mark 7, 20 to 23. I love the way the New Living Translation puts it. It says, and this is Jesus speaking, it is what comes from inside that defiles you. Did you hear that? It is what that comes from inside that defiles you. You look good on the outside, and inside you're poisonous, you're toxic, you're defiled. But it's what is inside you that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within, Jesus said, and they are what defile you. See, so what is God looking for now? I want to tell you, we are in a time, people, right now where God has raised the bar. He is calling His church to a higher level of consecration and, and obedience to Him. He's telling us that we have to go deeper. And God is saying that He's looking for men and women that are more concerned about what they look like on the inside than they do on the outside. Psalm 51 verse 6, David said, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. You see, that's what it's all about. What is happening in your heart when you're alone, when no one sees you? Your parents don't see you. Maybe your spouse doesn't see you. Your pastor doesn't see you. But when you're all alone, what's really going on in your life? What are you thinking? What are you feeding your mind? What are you looking at? What are you listening to? What are you saying? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's about what's inside. Jesus said of the Pharisees, Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee! First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will be clean. The righteousness of God is what I call inside-out righteousness. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 13 says that He would establish your hearts blameless in holiness. It's a holiness of the heart. Yes, it affects the way we speak, the way we dress, the way we talk. True holiness does. But, you see, you can, you can look good on the outside and be toxic on the inside. Like the Pharisees. So God is looking for people that are committed to Him from their hearts. I use this illustration a lot, but Joseph is down in Egypt. Here he is, Potiphar's wife. She's hot, man. She comes after him. And what happens? She wants Joseph, and Joseph does not give in at all. Not one bit. It's not even an issue. It's not even a temptation. Can I say that? Why? How can I sin against God? And do what is evil in his eyes. He didn't say, how can I sin against my, my girlfriend, my pastor, my daddy? He said, how can I sin against God? He had the perfect opportunity. No family there, no pastor, no father, no one. He could have, he could have committed it and gotten away with the perfect crime, so to speak. But he said, I know there is one that sees all things, and I cannot sin against him. What I do in secret will be revealed and brought out to the light. And I'm telling you, we're living in a time when God is exposing. I'm seeing it happen all over the place. It's crazy. It's frightening at times. Because why? God is realigning his church in order that we can be used by him God does not want to allow this community to go to hell he want you to go to hell if you don't know him he doesn't want your neighbors to go to hell he doesn't want the people in this nation to go to hell and you know what the hope of America is what Christ in us Christ in you Christ in me the hope of glory
That's the only hope this nation has. That's the only hope the, the nations of the world have. He doesn't have a plan B. Angels aren't going to do it. It's us or no one. So he's looking for inside-out righteousness. Let me ask you a question. Are you a trash can or are you fine china? What do I mean by that? 2 Timothy chapter 2. In a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Are you a vessel of honor? Fine china? Or are you a trash can, a vessel of dishonor? Listen. The message paraphrases it this way. In a well-furnished kitchen, there are not only crystal goblets and silver platters, but waste cans and compost buckets. Some containers are used to serve fine meals, others to take out the trash. Become the kind of container God can use to present any and every kind of gift to his guests for their blessing. Oh, hallelujah. Did you hear that? Now, he says, become the kind of container God can use to present any and every kind of gift to his guests for their blessing. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He's calling us to a place of being vessels of honor. Now, we have to deal with the toxic roots in our life. We have to deal with those things that defile us from within. I'm telling you, things are drying up spiritually. I'm going to churches, and I'm finding churches that are on fire for God, and I'm going to other places, and it's dried up by the roots. And some of these churches that are now dried up by the roots were places that formerly we ministered, and the power of God was strong, and the presence of God was definitely there, undeniably. But God is drying up things. He's drying up things in individuals' lives and churches' lives. I, I don't have time to get into this, but I, I sense that there's a shift that's taking place. And God is going to make a distinction. He's making a distinction between those who are truly His and those who are His in name only. And He's calling us to literally make a decision. Which side are we going to go? Are we going to play religion? Are we going to continue to just live the way we're living constantly falling struggling not overcoming or are we going to shift into the glory realm if we're going to shift into the glory realm where fruit abounds then we're going to have to change some things in our life number one we're going to have to pull up before we can plant jeremiah 110 jeremiah speaks about the pulling up do you know that that God is calling us to pull up every root. Just go there for a moment. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 10. See, I have set you this day over the nations, God said to Jeremiah, and over the kingdoms. And Jeremiah, here's what I'm calling you to do. Number one, to root out. Number two, to pull down. Thirdly, to destroy. Fourthly, to throw down. Then he says, to build and to plant. Notice, four terms of destruction, two terms of construction. Now, before you can build, you've got to clear brush. You've got to uproot some things. You've got to clear the land. Amen? And God is saying that before we build, we have to remove and uproot those things that are hindering we have to deal with those things that are hindering. I already spoke about some of these things, but we have to deal with those things that are toxic in our life. We're going to have to deal with these roots. We're going to have to deal with these things. Now, not only are we to pull up the ungodly roots, we're to plant deeper roots. There are a lot of Christians right now, let me tell you this. Righteousness, when you study the scripture, holiness, when you study the scripture, isn't stopping doing certain things. And that's it. I don't cuss. I don't watch bad things on TV. I don't commit adultery. I, I don't, you know, do these kind of things. Therefore, I'm holy. No, 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 no. That's not holiness. Holiness literally means to be separated unto. It's not just 
separation from. Part of holiness is separation. Come out. Be you separate. But the Bible says that we're to cleave unto the Lord. We're to hold fast to God. Because we can't be holiness in our own strength. We can't have holiness in our own strength. It's the presence of God that makes us holy. It's the Holy Spirit. He's not just the Spirit, but He's the Holy Spirit. And He works in us to make us holy. The blood and the Spirit. The blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness, but the Spirit of God empowers us so that we can walk in a place of grace and authority. We can live at a level of power over sin. Not just pardon from sin, but power over sin. And if you think that grace is just pardon from sin, you don't understand grace. You maybe understand mercy, but not grace. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Titus chapter 2, 11 and 12. Sin shall have no dominion over you, for you're not under law, but you're under grace. Romans 6, 14. See, Hebrews 12 chapter speaks about serving God with reverence. Serving God acceptably because of grace. Because of grace. Now, by the grace of God, which literally means that divine influence, that divine power that's working in us behind the scenes, causing us to desire the things of God and also to live the life that He's called us to live. Why was Jesus anointed? more than anyone else. Read Hebrews 1.9. Hebrews 1.9. Because you hate iniquity and loveth righteousness. Therefore God, your God, has, has anointed you with the oil of joy above more than your companions, your brothers. He was anointed more than anyone else. Why? He hated sin and loved righteousness. Let me tell you something. That hating sin is something that is, to be, is, is natural when we know how to walk in the Spirit. It's natural. My burden is what? Lie to my yoke is easy. It's not to be a difficult thing. But we have to learn to walk in the Spirit. We have to learn to walk in the Spirit. How do we walk in the Spirit? I've already alluded to it. We abide in Him. We stay connected to Him. We, we do that. It says in John 15 verse 9 that when we obey His commandments, we abide in Him. When we do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Now listen again. If you think, well, God, what, you know what? I'm trying to obey God's commands and I can't do it. Listen to me. You're right. You can't do it. And the best we can do is the external form. In other words, the letter of the law, but not the Spirit. But God is saying, but when my spirit, when you have communion with me, and when my Holy Spirit is empowering and infusing my life into you, you will bear much fruit. The manifestation of my life will be seen in you. And America and the nations of the world today don't need to see another church open up on the corner. Don't need to see just another religious people or have another service. But what they do need to see is a manifestation and a demonstration of the life of God being expressed through a people. That's what's going to change our culture. Man, if, you, if your faith is just about showing up to church on Sunday or Wednesday or whenever else, you don't understand Christianity. It's not Christianity. Jesus said, 1 John 2, 6, If anyone says he abides in him, let him walk even as he himself walked. John 14, 12, The works that I do shall you do also. Greater works. Why? Because I go to the Father, and when he went to the Father, what? He could give the Spirit. That's it. Hallelujah. I'm glad I wasn't raised in a religious home. I'm glad I wasn't. But let me tell you, it doesn't mean that, that only those who've been raised in a religious home can understand what I'm saying. All right. Let me tell you about deep roots. Go with me to Jeremiah 17. I'm going to close with this. Well, maybe I'll close with this. I don't want to be a liar. You know where liars go, right? It says in Revelation to the altar. Real repentance. Okay. 
Jeremiah 17, planting deep roots. Verse 7 and 8, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. Literally it means whose shelter is in the Lord, whose place of residence is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes. But its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought. Nor will what? Cease from yielding fruit. In other words, the man, the woman, who is established in God, the righteous, that person, that man, that woman, will continually bear fruit. The life of God will be manifested in them. Even in the time of drought, they will, their lease will be green, they will not be afraid, and they will never cease from yielding fruit. Why? Verse number 8 says, Because they spread out the roots by the river. The New Living Translation says, They are like trees planted along a river bank with roots that reach deep into the water. Listen. What happens when you go through a, a dry season? I mean, how many of you, come on, we talk about our first love, falling from our first love, we go, you know what? Do I want to tell you, you know my walk with God is? It's better than it ever was. But do I want to tell you, there's a price. There's a cost. i got to stay connected. And I've been through seasons of dryness, and I've been through trials, and I go through trials. Some of the trials that I go through would blow some of you away. But I want to tell you that I've learned to bear fruit in every season by the grace of God, not by my own righteousness. And how we do it is when the heat comes, when the, when the water isn't there, what does the tree do? It spreads out its roots. Extends its roots, goes deeper. And it goes deeper and it searches until it finds the nutrition and the nourishment that it needs. That's what he's saying in this hour. Church, you may not be depressed. You may not be discouraged. You might be on top of the world right now. That is not the issue. The issue is, are you bearing fruit? Is the life of Christ being manifested through you? Are you bearing much fruit? Are you a barren tree? Are you lifeless, not producing anything? Or are you bearing fruit? When the time of drought comes, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be anxious. But you do have to go deeper. And as we were worshiping the Lord earlier, I have heard it very clearly from the Holy Spirit, Pastor Sandy. God said, this church needs to pray. He told me, he said, tell the people they need to go deeper and they need to pray. And I see it in the Spirit, a people gathering to call out in the name of the Lord. I tell you, historically, if you study revival, when revivals are broken out, there's never been a revival that was broken out without preceding prayer. Often, typically, two years of prayer before it really broke out. There's a place for private prayer. We must pray every day. Luke 5, 16, Jesus withdrew to the wilderness. Mark 1, 39, he got up early, he prayed. We've got to have that. Can you not watch and pray one hour? The word one hour in Greek means one hour. We might try to spiritualize it. Well, Jesus didn't mean 60 minutes. What? Then spiritualize the rest of the Bible. We had to go deep. I'm telling you that God is poised and ready to pour out His glory. But we got to go deep. We got to go after God. We have to seek Him. We're summoned by the Spirit to uproot all ungodly roots in our life. Tear them up. Deal with it. Secondly, plant those deep roots. 
Let me tell you something. Uprooting something isn't an easy job, is it? Have you ever had to uproot a, you know, a tree? You got that stump there? Oh man, this roots are stubborn, aren't they? But I want to tell you that if you persist, God's going to do it through you and in you. He's going to set you free. I want you to stand with me this morning. I would like the, at least the, the pianist to just come to the keyboard for now.